あ、皆様こんにちは。今日は英語サロンにお越しくださいましてありがとうございます。えー、お時間になりましたのでそろそろ始めさせていただきたいと思います。最初ですけれども、えっ、ー、とちょっとだけあの今日の注意事項と言いますかあのお知らせしたいと思います。日本語でお知らせしたいと思います。えー、とまずですね、皆様の携帯電話の方、あのスイッチをマナーボードの方にお願い、あの書いていただきますようお願いいたします。えー、それから、えー、駐車券の方、駐車場を使い慣れてる方、えー、駐車券の方、えー、スタンプをされましたでしょうか。あの一応あの受付のところでスタンプをしておりますので、3時間無料になりますので、あのお帰りまでに押していただくようにお忘れないようお願いいたします。それからと、えー、今日本日ですけれども、えー、イベントの様子を写真で撮影いたします。えー、私たちの方のあのホーム、えー、Facebook とか、えー、TIA のホームページとにも写真が載ることがあります。でそれをまたあの、えー、広報活動実感をしていただくことがありますので、えー、もしあの写真に写られたくない方がいらっしゃいましたら、えー、お申し出いただきますようお願いいたします。よろしいでしょうか。皆さん、映りたくない方、見えましたら、あのこっそりスタッフの受付か、私の方までお知らせ。よろしいですかね。大丈夫そうですかね。はい。えー、っと、それで今日のスケジュールですけれども、今日、今から、えー、ジェームス先生、今日のスピーカーのジェームス先生の方にマイクを渡ししまして、45分くらい、最初、えー、英語で、英語のみのスピーチになります。ちょっと今日,今日は特にあの通訳等は入っておりません。英語のみのスピーチになります。えー、ので、そちらが45分ぐらい続きまして、その後、えー、後ろの方にお飲み物やお菓子をご用意しておりますので、えー、と今日そちらはあの今日の会費に含まれておりますので、皆様、ちょっと休憩を取っていただきまして、その後、えー、それ10分ぐらいで、その後は、えー、と皆さんからも自由に、えー、戻お席に戻っていただいて、えー、Q&A。はい、にさせていいいたただきたいと思いますでその時はえジェームス先生に皆さんから自由に英語でも日本語でも結構ですのでえ質問していただいてえ答えていただく時間になりますのでよろしくお願いいたしますで終了はえ大体3時半ぐらいを予定しておりますよろしくお願いしますえっとそれではぼちぼちじゃあここからは英語でえ進めていきたいと思いますえっと、一応ボランティアの方がおりますのでもし後で、えっと、内容等ちょっと質問があるよとかありましたらあのお声かけくださいちょっと、えー、日本語で、えー、あのそんな完全な通訳ではありませんけど内容をあのお知らせすることができると思います、えー、とそれでは、えー、と So welcome everyone welcome to English Salon and this English Salon has been organized By a TIA volunteer group, English Information for Friends, for over 25 years. We have invited foreign residents、uh, from various countries who live、uh, in and out of Toyota City. So, today, please relax and enjoy、uh, our guest speaker's speech. So, let me introduce Mr. James Fletcher. <laughs> Hello, everybody. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. I'm really excited to be here. It's really wonderful to see so many people. And、um, so I was really excited when I was asked if I could give a talk about any topic that I liked. So、uh, um, I always enjoy the opportunity to talk about things that I'm really passionate about. And one of the things that I'm really passionate about. Is the time that we're living in now and all the discoveries that we're making about our past、um, and the universe. And、um, I guess I've always been an artist, really, at heart. I love, I love doing art since I was a small child, and I've always been interested in science fiction. And I always imagined when I was about four or five years old that when I get to be an adult, We'll all be flying around in flying cars and living on the moon and going for holidays on Mars.、Um, so I've always been a bit, a bit that way. I, I just love thinking about the future. Anyway,、um, the topic of today's talk 
is Living in the New Paradigm. And the reason I gave it that title is because I had to give a title and I was thinking, oh, what can I call it? Uh, before I'd really thought about what I wanted to do. So, <laughs> um, let me explain. I'm going to talk about how we view the past and um, how we view the present and how we are beginning to view the future. And I'll present a contrast between the mainstream view the mainstream view is the view that you get from the education system, from TV, newspapers. That's the what I refer to as the mainstream. It's kind of like the normal view. Um, and I'm going to contrast that with what I've discovered. And there's a big difference I've found. Um, most of us are too busy to think about the big questions in life, and we have even less time to research them, we tend to accept what we learnt at school and through the mainstream media, especially TV. And I have, I have learned that, um, uh, that there's a, as I said before, there's a very big difference between the mainstream view and reality. Um, and I like ideas. I, I found that um, rather than believing in things, it's, it's much better to entertain ideas because you're not attached to ideas. You can always change your idea. But if you have beliefs, you have to hold on to them. So um, what I present to you are ideas. Um, and I invite you to do your own journey of investigation and discovery. But I'd like to share with you what I've discovered. So, um, it's basically a slideshow. <laughs> so, um, let's start. Uh, this is Yoda. He's a master Jedi. And he's my guru. <laughs> uh, from Star Wars. And um, this is the big message that when you start to discover and investigate reality, this is really, really important. You must unlearn what you have learned. You must unlearn what you've learned at school, what you've learned from your parents, what you've learned from society. Oh, wrong button. <laughs> One of the things about learning about reality is learning who we are and where we came from. And this is a quote from Graham Hancock. He said that we, the human species, we are a species with amnesia. That means that our human species has forgotten our real past. Something happened and we've lost our memory. So it's like we've had a bang on the head and we've woken up and we can't remember who we are, we can't remember where we came from. But now, we're starting to remember who we are and where we came from. And it's quite interesting. Um, this is a diagram. It's a 15,000 year timeline. So, over here on the right is the present day. And we go back in thousands of years, there's 2,000 years, 4,000 years, right back to 15,000 years ago. Now this is what we are taught at school. We are taught that civilization started about 5,000 years ago. That's when human civilization started cities, agriculture, and so on. So if we go right back to nearly 5,000 years ago, we have Stonehenge, we have the pyramids in Giza in Egypt. 2,000 years ago, we had the Colosseum. Recent history. If we go back 13,000 years ago, that was the end of the Ice Age. And um, uh, that was, uh, yeah, about 13,000 years ago, the Ice Age end ended. So th this is what we're taught at school. Okay, let's look a little bit closer. 
Um, recently, discoveries are being made that make us look again at what our history is. There's evidence showing that um, human civilization is much, much, much older than we previously thought. So let's look at some of the evidence. Um, this is Lebanon. And um, in Lebanon, there's a town called Baalbek. And let's look at Baalbek. This is the Roman temple of Jupiter in Baalbek. Uh, it's about 2,000 years old. And there's a wall on the western side of Baalbek, which um, is very, very interesting. It contains these huge, huge stones that um, weigh between 800 tons and 1,000 tons. And they lie on top of smaller, smaller blocks down here. There's a little man standing here, so you can get an idea of how these blocks, how big these blocks are. Just mind blowing. Um, this is the river, it's a dried up river. Um, you can see at the top of the picture, you can see the, the temple there. It's about a kilometer away. And this is where they quarried the stones and somehow moved them one kilometer and stacked them up. Um, this this uh, cut stone is about a thousand tons and that's about the same weight as three jumbo jets. Um, what engineers think when they see this and um, they think there was technology involved in moving the stones from that location to the temple. And that technology may have been something like steam power or gasoline power, but it was some kind of technology that we would think of as modern. Here's another view of the wall. Um, it's very common, especially on, in sacred sites around the world, that um, Structures are built on top of old structures. Uh, when you have a sacred site, um, over time, uh, new structures are built on top of the old structures. And I think you can see that here. On top, we have these blocks which were put there by the Romans. Um, below that, we have these other blocks, kind of slightly bigger, and they were probably put there by the ancient Greeks 1,000 years earlier. Now these blocks, we have no idea who put them there. That was probably a much older civilization that we've forgotten about. So, um, now we're going to move to Turkey. And... Um, there's a, there's a place in Turkey called Gobekli Tepe. And um, uh, recently, in, um, uh, in the last 10 years, a German archaeological team has been digging uh, at this site. And what they've found has completely rewritten history. Let's have a, look, have a closer look. This is the dig site. And under the ground, they found this, um, this ancient uh, structure. Actually, there's a series of structures, and so far they've only excavated about 10%. What you see is only a small fraction of what's been excavated. This site has been dated to 12,000 years. Um, that's not in dispute, that's mainstream science, um, which is more than twice as old as uh, Stonehenge. Um, there's some beautiful carvings on the rock, 
of animals that existed at that time. Beautiful artwork. This man is uh, Klaus Schmidt. He's the team leader for the German archaeological team. Sadly, he died this year. Um, but his, his work and his team work has been really, really important in changing our view of the past. Okay, now let's head over to South America. Um, we're going to look at a site in Bolivia called uh, Pumapungu, uh, which is near the border with Peru. And at this site, there are a series of blocks. Uh, you can see in this picture that they've all been laid neatly in a row. Originally, they weren't like that. They were just jumbled together. But over the last 60, 70 years, people uh, have tidied it up a little bit. But originally, this site was devastated. It, something happened, and the structure was completely collapsed. The interesting thing about this place is that there is evidence of machine um, machines being used to carve the stone, precise machines. Um, you can see the right angles are beautifully 90 degrees, um, very, very clean. This rock is, uh, is very hard, it's, it's not a soft rock. Let's take a closer look. This is a piece here. You can see evidence of saw cuts and drilling, precise drilling. Oh dear. <laughs> oh, we're back, good. Take a closer look. When engineers look at these blocks, they, they, they see they see power machines being used. They see clear evidence that these blocks were cut using technology that wasn't supposed to exist then. Uh, there's a clearer picture of the, um, of the machining. Very, very precise. So to engineers when they look at this, this is clear evidence that sometime in the, in the distant past, there was a human civilization that had a much higher level of technology, and this civilization was lost. And um, now we're going to Egypt, and this is the uh, Sphinx, of course. And there's been a lot of controversy in the last 20 years. Um, engineers have looked at the wall surrounding the Sphinx, and they found evidence of water erosion, uh, which is um, the last time that this area received rainfall was before the last ice age, more than 13,000 years ago. So it appears that um, the Sphinx is much, much older than we previously thought. And of course, the Egyptians have re-sculpted it and repaired it, um, but there is evidence, clear evidence, that uh, it, it's much older. You can see the um, there's a little diagram over here. This shows what rain erosion looks like, and over here is um, what wind erosion looks like. And you can see over here that well, it looks like rain erosion. There was a professor, uh, Robert Schock, who did studies on this, and he's um, uh, an expert in rain erosion. Oh, that, that's a more clear view. And so this is directly behind the, the pyramid. There's, there's a lot of water erosion. Um, 13,000 years ago, the Sahara Desert was a temperate climate with lots of rainfall. Okay, and another another very recent discovery, this one is um, 2004 in Indonesia. At a place called Gedang Parang. And um, this is uh, a very ancient site 
which has received a lot of study recently. And um, the, the dating evidence suggests that this site is about 15,000 years old. This is what it would have looked like sometime before the last ice age ended. And this is a, 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 a view looking further back. I think there was a picture of the archaeologist. I'll just somehow go on. Oh, here they are. So they've done um, radar penetrating and um, seismic uh, studies of the area. And um, there's been a lot of effort uh, spent on the site determining its age. And again, like Gobeke Tepe, this site is completely rewriting um, the human history. So um, this is um, an updated timeline of uh, recent human civilization. Um, so it appears that there was a very sophisticated uh, human civilization that existed uh, during the Ice Age. And then something happened about here uh, something bad, something really, really bad happened, and civilization was destroyed almost completely. And then thousands and thousands of years passed, and finally, about 5,000 years ago, civilization was rebooted. Control, alt, delete. So that, that is a, a, a new paradigm in thinking about uh, human history. So now let's go back 13,000 years and have a look at what the planet looked like just before the end of the last ice age. So this is um, what, what it looked like. Over here, this is the top of Africa. There's uh, Spain, Europe, The ice uh, extends from Canada right over through Russia and down into Europe. And of course, this, this ocean area would also have been covered in ice. The ice over the land was up to three kilometers deep. It's three kilometers deep, uh, thickness of ice. And when the ice age ended, all that water went into the ocean and the sea level rose about 150 meters about 13,000 years ago. So that's, you know, we talk about climate change. Um, our, our human uh, influence on the climate is nothing compared to what happened at the end of the Ice Age. Um, 13,000 years ago, um, there were woolly mammoths in North America and Siberia. There were elephants. In fact, in, a, in North America, there were three species of elephants. Africa's just got one species. India's just got one species. But North America had three species of elephant. There were giant sloths. Uh, very nasty looking big cats. So, if a world civilization did exist before the end of the last ice age, what happened to it? And what caused the extinction of the mammoths, mastodons, giant sloths, and other large animals so suddenly from North Europe, uh, from Europe and North America at the same time? Africa was fine. It wasn't really affected much. But the rest of the world, um, there was a large extinction event. And it's been a mystery as to what caused it. But um, uh, very, very recently, um, scientists have found what happened 
they have clear evidence of what caused the end of that advanced civilization and what caused the extinction of so many large animals. And this is what it was. It was a, a comet or an asteroid that struck the ice cap and caused instantaneous melting of the ice and huge floods. And the evidence for this um, is in, in the form of micro diamonds and uh, other micro particles which are caused by impacts with asteroids and comets. These are microscopic tiny particles caused by that kind of impact. Um, you can see here there's a, a side of a cliff and this line here, this dark line, is called the Younger Dryas Boundary. And anything, all the animals below this, below this line, all, uh, in North America, all the large animals, the mammoths and so on, are alive. And above this line, they're all dead. The, the layer also contains soot and other um, evidence of burning ash and so on. And these are, this is the area that was affected mostly. Um, these are where all the samples have been taken from. Samples have been taken from ice cores. Samples have been taken from uh, soil layers and so on. A large body of evidence has been collected and analysed. There's um, a team in the University in Southern California that have been spent a lot of time collecting this, um, this evidence. Here's um, what they think happened. Uh, a series of impacts, not just one, but maybe several or more, uh, hit the ice cap. Because when comets approach a planet, they often break apart due to the gravity. And then they hit like a machine gun. And um, so there were probably multiple impacts. And it could have been over a series of years, of, you know, a few years, because the Earth would come back around the sun and pass through the trail again of that comet. It created huge flooding the ice water would come flooding across the plains. Also, um, the heat and ash would come down, creating huge fires. And um, another mystery which uh, scientists couldn't explain is this, this, um, if you, this is the Ice Age, and actually about 3,000 years ago, the Earth was coming out of the Ice Age. The temperature was rising. The ice was getting less and less and less. Glaciation was decreasing. We were heading for a warmer period. And suddenly, uh, 12,800 years ago, suddenly we went into a, a, an extreme cold period again, which lasted for about 1,100 years. And then finally, the Ice Age ended. So this has been a big mystery. The, what happened is that um, when the comets impacted, they created a lot of debris and dust and ash that went high into the atmosphere. And that actually cooled the planet down. A bit like, I don't know if you've heard the nuclear win winter theory, that uh, if you have a lot of um, debris being put high into the atmosphere, it blocks the sunlight and it, the, the Earth cools down. So this explains the, the previous mystery about why there was a sudden cooling. And um, I don't know if any of you remember, but in 1994, exactly the same thing happened to Jupiter. A large comet named Shoemaker-Levy approached Jupiter, and as it approached Jupiter, it broke apart into smaller pieces. 
some of these pieces were two to three kilometers in size. If one of those pieces had hit Earth, we wouldn't be here now. And um, although we couldn't see the impact because the satellites were on the, it impacted the far side of Jupiter, so we couldn't see it directly. But when Jupiter spun back around into sunlight, we could see the scars left by these comets. So you had multiple impacts, bang, 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 bang. And this is what happened to the North, North Ice Cap during the Ice Age. Um, you can see the comet would have come here, bang, and then the debris would have sprayed out. And if, there, if Jupiter's just gas, but if there had been forests there, they would have been set on fire. And just this area here would be about the size of the United States. And more recently, uh, no, actually, that's wrong. A little bit further back, about 100, 100 years ago, in 1908, uh, a small comet or an asteroid hit Siberia. And um, it actually exploded in the atmosphere, but it created this huge shock wave it would have exploded about 20 kilometers in the air. But the, the size was about the same size as a, as a large hydrogen bomb. And it just cleared hundreds of square miles of forest were completely flattened. And that was, that was only just over 100 years ago. Um, these are some photographs of the forest that were flattened in that impact. And of course, um, if you go back 63 million years ago, um, a huge asteroid hit the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico and wiped out the dinosaurs. That's perhaps what it might have looked like. And remember that this, this would be traveling at about 70 kilometers in one second. That's a huge impact. So, um, what does the information from the past teach us? Well, number one, it teaches us that human civilization may be much, much older than we thought. Number two, civilizations rise and fall. Number three, and this is the really important one, the surface of a planet is an unstable and dangerous place to live and we need to be able to get off it or we need to be able to push away the asteroid or comet which means that technology is really really important and maybe that's why we're here <laughs> um, also interestingly it shows that a scientific space-faring human civilization can develop in only 500 years, which is, 500 years sounds like a long, long time, or 500 years. But when you look at human history, 500 years is a very, very short time. So 500 years ago was the beginning of modern science, and now we, we have smartphones and iPads and space travel. That happened in only 500 years. I wonder how many times this could have happened in the past, and um, we've lost we've lost track of that that civilization that's completely disappeared. Okay, that was the end of part one. That was about the past. Um, now we're going to look at the present. If I can get this working. There you go, the present, which will be here presently. Because there's some pretty amazing things which are happening right now. 
which you don't often see on TV, but which are really, really exciting. Okay, um, first we're going to look at the universe and our understanding of the universe is changing rapidly. We live in a galaxy called the Milky Way and our Milky Way contains 300 billion stars and there are about 170 billion other galaxies in the universe. Number three, most scientists agree that the universe is full of life, including intelligent life. Most scientists would agree with that. Number four, science has no problem with the idea of intelligent ET, extraterrestrial, civilizations. They don't have a problem with it. However, most scientists, not all scientists, most scientists believe that it is impossible for them to travel between the stars because stars are so far apart and it would take thousands and thousands of years to meet the neighbors. Six, modern science is about 500 years old on our planet. In 500 years, we have gone from riding horses to airplanes, space rockets, and smartphones. What if an ET civilization was a thousand years old or a million years old, what would they be able to do? Well, I suggest that their technology would look like magic to us. This is our Milky Way galaxy. And most people can't see it because at night there's too much light, you can't see it. But um, it's always there, it's always, we're always surrounded by it. We're always surrounded by stars. Beautiful sight. Now, recently, scientists, mainstream scientists, um, have announced that um, they believe faster than light travel is possible. This is um, Dr. Howard White. He's a professor. At, he works for NASA. He also worked for Lockheed Martin, and he worked for Boeing. And he's a physicist. And he's been doing experiments for NASA on warp drive technology. He did a presentation uh, which was put on YouTube uh, last year. It's about a one-hour video, and it's absolutely mind-blowing. Um, I'm not a physicist, but um, Einstein said that you cannot go faster than the speed of light, and that is absolutely true. You cannot go faster than the speed of light in space-time. But space-time can expand or contract faster than the speed of light. So, for example, when the universe was born in a Big Bang, the universe expanded many times faster than the speed of light. So a warp drive creates a distortion or a wave in space-time, which can travel much faster than the speed of light. So if you build a spaceship that can distort space-time, you can travel faster than the speed of light. So it is no longer impossible to uh, travel faster than the speed of light. Mainstream scientists are showing that it is possible and um, uh, the, the physics agree with that. Um, this is part of his presentation, the NASA presentation, explaining this, this would be a spaceship, and it's riding, it's riding a, a, um, a warp in space-time. And this idea has been around for 40 or 50 years, but the amount of energy required to do this was just almost impossible. You'd need the whole energy of a sun to do it. Well, using new information and new physics, 
they believe they can do it with much, much less energy than they thought originally. So it is now not an impossible idea. This was in the Washington Post recently. Um, they did a bit of big article about NASA's presentation. This is an artist's view of what the spaceship might look like. And this is sometime in the future, 100 years, 200 years. But uh, in our future, this is a concept of uh, what it might look like. Um, these are some of the experiments that I've been doing. And all the experiments so far have proved positive that it is possible. So to say that scientists believe that it's impossible to travel faster than the speed of light is wrong. So if we, if we, if we have the, the ability to travel to other stars, then it must be possible for other ET civilizations to be able to travel as well. Um, also, there's been a, a big change of um, a new paradigm in physics, in quantum physics and relativity. Does anybody know who this guy is? It's a silly question because I put his name there. <laughs> uh, but this is Nassim Harriman. He's a Swiss-Italian physicist. And um, his, his paper, he recently won the best paper award at, uh, in, at the Brussels University. And uh, he, he's kind of like a new Einstein. You know, you often hear about the new Einstein, but I think this guy's the real deal. What he has discovered is completely crazy. But um, the more they look at it, the more they understand that this guy could be right. He said that every proton is a black hole and that um, there's only two forces in the universe. There's electrogravity and, uh, uh, sorry, electromagnetism, which is electricity and radiation, and the other one is gravity. There are only two forces in the universe. At school, you're taught there are four forces. He says there are only two. And the reason why, um, uh, um, you know, the, uh, we have this strong nuclear force is because we didn't understand that each proton was a black hole. And you think um, each proton contains as much information and energy as the whole universe. So each proton is a whole universe, according to his theory. Also, um, we think matter is very energetic. E equals mc squared. Matter equals energy. So if you have a proton, that is a very energetic particle. However, um, there's something much, much more energetic than matter. Something inf almost infinitely more energetic um, than matter. And that is space. We think of space as being empty, but um, Phys not just Nassim Harriman, but other phys physicists are now understanding that space is actually super dense and contains uh, one cubic centimeter of space, that's like a little one centimeter by one centimeter by one centimeter cube, um, contains more um, energy than the, the entire universe. Ah, okay. So, um, what, what we'll do is, um, this is probably a good time to take a 10 minute break, and then we'll continue after that. So, end of part one. Enjoy some tea and uh, snacks just at the back of the room.